it's mid to late March. Yeah. Some schools out there are diving into spring ball. You guys are done with spring ball already. Right. And rumor on the street is you had pretty decent weather up here. You had to use the indoor like <laughs> twice. Yeah. So I don't know how that works out. But what's the methodology behind choosing to go that early for spring? There's a lot of different reasons. It, it starts with player safety. Um, anytime you divide spring practice over spring break, most people get a few in and then they give everybody a nine-day layoff and then they come back and practice. Um, research says that that's the greatest opportunity to injure your players. And so, you know, we try to reduce that. Um, our spring break is the last week in March. So it gives us an opportunity to get all of it done before March. Don't put them in that uh, risk uh, as far as injury. But then it allows us to figure out, okay, this is what we have, this is where, we at, where we're at, and this is five months of uninterrupted training to get better. And we utilize April uh, with spring access through the NCAA for walkthroughs. We, we use uh, June for OTAs, uh, and our strength coach is allowed to, to really get our guys right. And, and you, look, you think about the college football cycle, there's really not another time period where you can get four to five months of uninterrupted training. Uh, for your guys, and so as a as a you know developmental program, a group that do, you know we pride ourselves on really getting our players better and finding different ways to to improve them not only fundamentally but speed, athletic movements. Um, this is the best way, most effective way for us. So I think typical fans they see you they see you win the Cotton Bowl, which we'll talk yeah. about in a little while. Then they you get a little break, then you go into spring ball, then you got this long break, mm -hmm. and they don't really check back in with you maybe until media days or fall camp starts. And there's this great unknown of like, what is Eli Drinkwitz doing on a random Tuesday <laughs> in June? I know I know a lot of you guys interact with other staffs. Yeah. Some of you even get out on the road and go visit with other staffs. And you've, of course, got a million and one things going on behind the curtain. So like we peek behind that curtain and I look at your schedule for the next five months. What's some yeah. of the stuff on there that a normal Tiger fan in Jefferson City never would have guessed you'd be doing? Whew. Well, probably taking my kids to school. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that we love to do as a staff in April when spring ball's over is we bump our staff meetings back to 8.15 in the morning so the coaches can, can make sure they can take their kids to school. I think it's important for us to, to try to have some semblance of balance uh, with our families. Um, but outside of that, it's, it's typically what you think. You know, our mornings we spend recruiting, uh, evaluating tape, and then in the afternoons we spend time on ball. Um, we'll do a staff retreat in April. Uh, I think I've got at least 10 caravan dates where we're going around Jeff City. Or we're actually going to Jeff City. We'll go to Chicago. We'll go to Dallas. Um, we'll go to different cities and, and promote Tiger football. Um, and then in June, man, it's, it's camp season. You know, uh, we have all kinds of little kids camps, evaluation camps, travel camps, uh, going and seeing, you know, what are the future prospects for the Tigers. Um, play a little golf as far as, you know, Tiger caravans. We'll, we'll do some, some golf outings um, and some fundraising. And, and, and then we'll squeeze in some time, you know, Tuesday afternoons. We do individual with our players. Uh, Wednesdays during June, we do brotherhood and ball. A lot of different things. And then Fridays, we have uh, Elite Edge Fridays where we'll, we'll do some specific training uh, for those guys and for our team, team building. So you mentioned the word there, fundraising. Yeah. And it's always been baked into the head coach's job, but it's really, really, really it's baked into the head coach's <laughs> yeah. job now. Yeah. So um, no one wants to sound like they're complaining on the record about anything ever. Yeah. Behind the scenes, one of the most consistent bits of feedback that I've gotten from you guys, and I'm talking about coaches, specifically at the head coaching position, is, man, there is a disproportionate amount of weight with NIL placed on us to spearhead fundraising. Yeah. And it, it has nothing to do with coaching ball. It has nothing to do with developing my guys. But yet, I got 24 hours in a day, and bigger and bigger, that chunk on the pie chart gets dedicated to things that are way, way off the field and out of this building. Where's your mind on all that? Well, it's a competitive advantage to win, right? And it's within the framework of the rules to, there's, there's no limit to what you can provide your student athletes through NIL, except what you can fundraise. So for us, it's it's what can I do to give our team, our program, our players the best advantage to try to win a championship. And it's just like anything else. Like if it's up to me 
to get it done, then I'm going to try to do everything within my power every waking second to figure out, okay, what what is it we can do? What phone calls can we make? What are the ends that we have? Is there a, a Fortune 500 business in the state uh, of Missouri that's a, that's a Tiger alum that we can get a hold of to see if we can spark a passion or interest? Um, because, again, like it, it is the... It is the fuel to success right now. And so, you know, I think for me, it's just one of those things that uh, if, if it gives us a, a competitive advantage, man, then I owe it to our team. And I owe it to this university and our program to do everything possible to try to, to maximize it. So if I went to Missouri in 1993 and I've gone on to make fortunes in whatever sector, whatever industry I've never even heard of, but I'm kind of cold on football, I've never been involved. Yeah. And you call me and you, you try and light that fire and you try and open my checkbook a little bit more and bring my interest up a little bit more. How similar does that feel to a recruiting call or, or a recruiting process? It's very similar. Um, you know, I think that's the, that's the thing about recruiting and that's the thing about fundraising is you try to figure out what do they know about the University of Missouri and how can I tie their experience or past thought processes into uh, the university. You know, I think recruiting really established is based on three things. It's, it's based on relationships. Um, it's based on selling. You're either selling what you've done in the past or what you plan to do in the future. And then it's about having a unique on campus experience, something that they haven't done anywhere else. You know, you don't want to go to a cookie cutter visit to, uh, Missouri to, to Ole Miss to Georgia. You know, you got to distinguish yourself somehow. And so it's just really the same thing in fundraising. You know, there was a, somebody that that we were able to to really develop a strong relationship with in the fundraising department hadn't really been uh, associated with the university for a while but when i sat down and had breakfast with him you know it was tied back into he remembered when we beat notre dame <laughs> three to nothing back in the 70s or when we went to beat usc or the first time that we beat nebraska uh you, you know and so at that point it was about stirring the echoes of of, of his uh, fandom in, in trying to get him back involved when you came here from App State, I'm always curious with any coach who takes over a new job, how long does it take you to get that place, to yeah. understand the stuff you're talking about, like what mattered to some of these people in the 70s? Yeah. What is the program today? What could it be? Like how, how long does it take to fully immerse yourself in that? Yeah, I, I think that was actually one of the things that I, I misjudged uh, becoming the head coach here was how long it would take me. And, and every place is uniquely different. It has its own unique story. And, and the same things and approaches that I had that worked for me at Appalachian State weren't going to work here. And I didn't realize that until after I was like, OK, this is this this uh, direction's not going to go. Um, you know, I, I think in every place has its own stories and, and unique fabric. It's it's. I don't know if there's a timetable on it, right? But I do think after my second year, I felt more and more comfortable about, okay, these are the people, these are the key stakeholders in the university, these are the key stakeholders in the program, this is the, the history of the university, this is what we can sell, um, these are some things, these are areas that we can work on, um, and, and this is the excitement about the future. Uh, and, I, and I think that's really kind of where we're at right now is a little bit of success that we had last year gives us uh, an excitement about, okay, this place can be all the things that we've dreamed about. And and we've got a roadmap of how to do it. Now we've got to consistently put those things in place. If you would have sketched out on a pizza box for me when you took the job, here's how I think it's going to go. Like, here's how I think I'm going to do it and yeah. I'm going to be able to do it. How much of that has a line through it now and how much of it's been consistent and we've adhered to it? Yeah, you know, it's, it's like that old... Uh, tweet you see where the like everybody thinks the line of success is like this and then it's yeah. really like this that would be the story i mean i thought oh shoot day day i step foot <laughs> on here man we'll get this thing cranking and it was really like man highs and lows and and um I, you know i think about um some of the excitement from year one right when we beat um uh, we beat lsu right out here the defending national champion uh you know, on the last play of the game, we beat Arkansas with a game-ending kick. We beat uh, Kentucky out here. You know, those those were unbelievable moments. But then I think about the next year, the lows of just getting smoked at home by Tennessee, um, losing the bowl game. You know, I, it, there were tremendous highs and tremendous lows, but it was our ability to continue to believe in the process. I think, you know, one of the guys that I attribute the most to our ability to succeed was uh, is Ryan Russell our director of athletic performance, his ability to be consistent in his approach and in his ability to preach, hey, this is going to be our success. We just have to stick with it. Um, and his faith in the process 
along with our faith and our process, I think really pushed us into the su success that we've had. So let me ask you this. You're the one ultimately that's tasked with casting the vision for the organization. Yeah. So things aren't going to go well every day, mm -hmm. yet you have to adhere to the process. Yeah. But you also have to understand when to change something. Mm -hmm. So where's the balance of things didn't go well today, but don't worry, we're not linear, but overall our trajectory is right versus no, we need a course correction in this department or that compartment. Yeah, I think for me, um, it really came down to I believe strongly in our core values. I believe strongly in being a developmental program. I believe strongly in how we recruit the right fit for our program. But sometimes the X's and O's and the strategies need to change. Uh, and for me, personally, it was about giving up play calling uh, and being more involved in the day-to-day uh, of our players' lives and be more involved in the day-to-day -day of, of getting fundraisers and going out and recruiting and getting the players here and empowering our coaches to have more X's and O's success. I, I, I just wasn't able to put the time that I needed to in into all facets of the program. You know, when you're the offensive coordinator at a school or the quarterback's coach, you can really focus in on just this area. And, and when you become the head coach, you're in charge of all of it. And you can't shun your responsibilities like I was of being the offensive coordinator and quarterback's coach for other successes um, or, or other job responsibilities. And so when I was looking back at, okay, what do we have to change? What, what are some things... You know, I actually had written it down in my journal, man. We got to turn everything upside down and figure out, you know, after we'd lost a Wake Forest, like we got to look at everything and see, you know, what what is it that's really good and what is it that's got to that's got to be changed. And ultimately that arrow just came right back to me. Like I had to change. I had to do something different because the core values were good, because the players in our program were good, because I believed in the process of what we were doing in the weight room. I felt like, okay, that could be just a little change that could have a dramatic success. How long have you kept a journal? Uh, well, honestly, since 2010, uh, when I went down to Auburn as a GA, um, I was like, you know, I'm going to just write some different things that have occurred. Just that was to a see. really good year to start journaling really at a really good, good place. Yeah, really good year, uh, especially with all the different things. In fact, <laughs> I've actually told Chiz I kept every one of our staff notes, and, and uh, I have it in a in a bundle. He wants to look back at it at some time. I just haven't sent it to him yet, but. It's interesting when you look back and see the, the highs and lows from college football, man. Uh, of course, that season there was a lot of highs, but it, it's it's a unique journey for sure. What would be the most, outside of the 2010 Auburn, yeah. what would be some of the most interesting chapters in there? Because it's going to be a book one day, so let's just go ahead and talk <laughs> about it. What would be the most interesting oh, chapter man. so far? Uh, boy, there all, there's all kinds of interesting chapters. I, I think probably one of the mo ones that really defines uh, my career is uh, I've been hired at, at Arkansas State. We win the conference championship. Coach Malzahn accepts the job at Auburn. All right, um, they hire somebody that I've never met before, have no connection to, it, Brian Harson at Arkansas State. I, I really have three different scenarios going on right there. I could go back to my hometown, be the, the head football coach, um, which would have paid a lot of money. I could have gone to Auburn in an off-the-field role, or I could really try to get a job at Arkansas State. And so, man, I put everything I had into trying to get a job at Arkansas State. In fact, I, I turned down the, the head football job at Alma. I told Coach Malzahn I wasn't going to go to Auburn, and I put everything into getting that job. And, uh, he and ultimately, uh, Coach Harson gave me an opportunity, interviewed me, waited about five days, and called me when I was going back home for Christmas uh, to celebrate Christmas before we left for the bowl game. And and offered me a job, and really, ultimately, that that changed the trajectory of, of my career. And so I think that was probably the most um, gut-wrenching time period for me uh, in coaching college football. You ever keep that in mind when you're hiring guys? And and, and how long it takes? But I know it's a process. Yeah. Like, you got to go through the process, yeah. but at the same time, guys are just waiting. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, when, you, when you get in these roles, you start realizing that there's a lot of different aspects to – hiring and firing people or moving on or giving opportunities and, and it's it's a real challenge because there's a lot more people affected than just the people in our building um, there's 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 a lot of lives being affected and, and usually kids lives and and it's a lot it's a lot but at the end of the day you know Chiz used to tell us this all the time as the head coach his loyalty was to Auburn and his loyalty was to the university that's what they hired him to do and I think one of the challenges that I've had as a head coach is separating um, personal relationships from professional relationships. And, and um, 
being able to separate friendship from business and holding people to a standard um, and not uh, allowing you know those lines to be blurred. So I was watching you recently, and you did you did the podcast. Give me the title of it again. Think like a farmer. Think like a farmer is set up amazing. Like aesthetically, yeah. that thing's <laughs> yeah. awesome. Maple Ranch. Yeah. And um, it's twice now. I've tried to remember the name of it on air, and very unprofessionally, I've forgotten it. That's so, okay. so that's why we brought you on the show today. Yeah. We appreciate it. Um, you talked about the thing with you and Heupel, and everyone grabbed onto it. You also threw a little apology out there for Dan Mullen, and no one grabbed onto it. <laughs> and did that surprise you at all? Yeah, that surprised me. Uh, I think I've visited this whole Tennessee stuff enough. But uh, yeah, you know, I, I I felt like looking back, um, there was something that that was. Uh, said in a radio interview that was, you know, not, not fair to Coach Mullen. I have a lot of respect for Coach Mullen, and I think he did an outstanding job at Florida, and I think he's a very professional, good football coach and a good man. And so, you know, I wanted to apologize to him if that got taken out of context or uh, so, yeah. And I was surprised that it really didn't hit the Internet, but, you know, may maybe this will keep, yeah. keep Dan from ranking us so low <laughs> or picking against us, you know, now that he's at ESPN. But That's how the media is. <laughs> yeah, the, the media they hold grudges, man. <laughs> they hold grudges. When, um, when you guys go down to Destin or when you're, when you're in a room physically with all the SEC head coaches, yep. there's never cameras. No one gets to go in there. Yep. And so there's like this theater of the mind that builds up with a lot of folks about what the vibe must be like inside that room. What's the vibe in a room full of SEC head coaches? Um, before the meeting starts, it's very relaxed. It's it's very candid. It's it's funny. Yeah, forget about uh, all that stuff. And then the meeting starts, and then what happens? Well, then Lane shows up. Yeah. you know, in his jogger short, yoga <laughs> jogger pants, and, and who knows? It goes off the rails at that point. No, it, it's it's very professional. I mean, you got some of the greatest minds in college football in a room, and at the end of the day especially now in the meetings that I've been at, we're all trying to do the very best we can, not only for our universities, but for the game of college football. And I felt like, you know, last we, this past year at winter meetings, um, you know, we, we had some very serious conversations about the recruiting calendar. And I felt like, man, as a collective group, we did as good a job as any meeting that I had been in about offering solutions. In fact, I think... Um, um, Coach Napier had the best idea, and we all kind of ran with it about moving up signing day to the first Wednesday and making December a dead period so that um, we could eliminate this speed speed of getting into the portal. You get into the portal so quick because people were trying to go on visits. But if you make December dead, then we're able to allow our teams to finish the bowl season, finish college football playoffs. And if you make January the time that guys will go out and figure out where they're going, you know, you might reduce the stress on the coaches. So, man, I felt like all of us, you know, kind of had um, some good ideas in that and pushed it. Um, Coach Smart's on the Rules Oversight Committee, um, you know, that he was sitting in the room and, and telling, we have an SEC head coach's text thread, and he was telling us, like, hey, this rule's up. What is everybody's take on it? So I think more now more than ever, we're really trying to work together for the game and, and try to do what's best again for the SEC and for college football. There's still times where, you know, we, we do have some arguments and some, some pushback about what's best for maybe my school versus what's best for their school. Um, one of them was about un, unbalanced formations. What's best for the offensive side of the ball versus <laughs> what's best for the defensive side of the ball. But for the most part, it's, it's pretty professional. What about the, um, what about that calendar change? You just talked about it yep. for a second. I know a lot of us in our world, in the college football world, we're paying attention to, oh, there's going to be a signing date right in the middle of conference championship week. But a lot of the high school guys are looking at the really, really early signing date, and they're asking, what's this going to do to a senior year of a high school kid? I've sat in those symposiums. I've listened to all the ideas. There is no perfect idea. No. So in terms of the negatives, with the new setup, how serious do you think that is? High school coaches concerned about what – early, early commitments may do and early signings may do to their kids' senior seasons. Yeah, ultimately, I was a high school football coach. That's that's what I was, what I got into, why I got into it. Uh, helped about 24 players go play Division One football over the course of my time. Um, I'm absolutely against the June signing period. I think it's uh, it speeds everything up. Coach Saban talked about this for as long as he was in those meetings. Every time we move something up, we just expedite the time with which recruiting begins. 
we've already got where now June or January you can actually have visit, you know, uh, you can visit with somebody in a school. You basically are doing uh, home visits just at the school. Uh, you know, if somebody start has the ability to sign in June, they're going to start asking about getting NIL, which is legal in some states, including my state, right? You're also going to have guys, you know, really when December signing period began, that's when you started seeing guys early enrollee. And now it's become the norm. Yep. And so, again, you're fast-forwarding the track of a senior. They're never going to get this time back. Their senior year in high school is some of the best time of their life. And they're they're not going to go to prom. They're not going to get that to to, to to play for state championships in basketball, and baseball, and wrestling, and track. Um but I think if you start doing it in June, you're going to start getting guys reclassified. We're already starting to see that. It's become it's going to become more of a norm. Are you going to start seeing guys opt out of their senior years in high school, right? Then what happens when coaches coaching changes happen? So I just think that the 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 negatives far outweigh the benefit. Again, are we doing it for the student athlete or are we doing it for college football? And and I think those questions don't get weighed enough, right? Like if we're doing it truly for the student athlete, then make it make sense. But none of those negatives are better for the student athlete. They're all better for whatever coach gets the, you know, oh, well, now we can have July vacation. Come on, man. Like, <laughs> what's best for the student athlete? What's best for the high school coach? And I, again, those, those student athletes, those players, those coaches are the collateral damage for us. And, and I, that for me is why I'm against it. You know, moving it up the first Wednesday in December, Again, that could have an impact on the conference championship teams, right? But you can't legislate college football based off of two teams uh, or eight teams. How many power conferences do we have now? At yeah, four. four so I, yeah. yeah, so eight teams? No, something like that. You know, in the NFL, the better you do, the more you get punished in the, in the draft process. Yeah. In college football, you don't really have that. And so I heard one person the other day put it this way. If the closest you come to getting punished for success in college football is – you got to worry about signing your next top five class as you get ready to play a conference title game. Peanuts compared to what the pro guys do. Love and that. I listened to it and I said, number one, I'm going to steal it. Yeah. And number two, it actually makes sense. Yeah. Well, so again, the NFL has mastered the market of making sure that they're relevant year round, right? And the most success, the more success you have, um, they, they penalize you in the draft. But what people have failed to realize in this new college football playoff model and, and, and what we're trying to do is in the NFL, there's 32 teams and 16 teams make the playoffs. The other 16 teams either sell a new coach or they sell they, they're getting the top five draft pick. In college football, what are we selling to the other, uh, again, if we're saying that there's 136 Division One playing schools and only 12 make the playoffs, what are we selling to all these other fan bases to keep them actively engaged? And that's where I'm a little bit concerned right now because, um, you know, in the NFL, a nine and seven team is going to make the playoffs. Yep. And so everybody's, oh, we, we're tired of seeing these six and six teams in, in bowl games. We're not tired of seeing eight and eight teams or nine and seven teams in the playoffs. So again, we're not celebrating the success. I think the bowl games are, are really important to the student athlete experience, but they're really important to keeping the fans engaged to what I consider the greatest game. In, in, in the world, in my opinion, is college football because it it, it really uh, is deep down in the fabric of the United States. I mean, it, it's it gets into the communities. You know, NFL again is great, but it's 32 major cities, right? College football gets into. I mean, at the again at the University of Missouri, we're the only Division One playing school in the state. We we, we touch around seven million people's lives. We have uh, alumni bases in Kansas City and St. Louis and you know St. Joe and, and Cape Girardeau. Right, you you go to states like New Mexico. They their team made the the NCAA tournament right now. I mean, there's two million people that are fired up. They don't have anything else. Mm -hmm. They don't they don't have a uh, 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 NBA team, an NFL team, an NHL team. They they have and there are other their famous, universities. Yeah, there are other famous places. The government won't even let them go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think that's one area that I'm a I'm a little bit concerned as we continue to chase the dollar um, from a business aspect. Um, we we better be sure that we keep the most important people that make our our sport so great the fans engaged how how often do you find yourself watching decisions get made conferences get realigned playoff gets expanded you see billions of dollars in the new tv deal and it's directly impacting you because you're a head coach of a major college football program but maybe you look at it and say i don't even know what went into that 
it's not going to impact what I do the rest of my work day here, so it just is what it is? Or do you try and stay looped in enough to where, hey, if your cousin asks you about it, you sound informed on it? Well, I try to stay as looped in as possible because I think, again, you're, you're always trying to find the best competitive advantage that you have, right? Um, I think the challenge is when decisions are being made about things, a la NIL uh, or transfer portal or recruiting calendar, and the input that you had was totally ignored. Yeah. Right. And I think that's where you get that. That's where the frustration begins for me. Um, and I know our commissioners are trying to do the best they can, but they have very limited expertise in what we actually deal with on a day to day basis. Um, and it's the same really with, with athletic directors and the heads of the NCAA, like they're not boots on the ground, right? If you look at Colin Powell, when he talks about leadership, boots on the ground impact the decisions, right? Because they actually know what's going on. And I think a little bit in the NCAA and a little bit in, in what decisions are being made, um, there's not enough expertise in, in, in the actual day to day of what's going on, uh, when the decisions are being made. I think I've had about a million folks, you may be a million and one, say the last voices being taken into account when making football decisions are football people's voices. Yeah. And it sounds like that's the sentiment that you pretty much feel as well. Well, again, I, I look at, and it's not just about football, right? You look at some of the conference realignment. Those are football-based decisions that are affecting a lot of other sports, right? When we talk about, I mean, you and I off camera, we're talking about Cal joining the ACC, You're talking about Oregon being in the Big Ten, Washington being in the Big Ten. That's all great. That's all awesome. Those are football-based decisions. Uh, but what about the other sports that are fixing to have to, all the travel, all the different things that impact those student-athletes? Were those, were those student-athletes considered in the decision-making process? If they were and that's the best decision made, great. I'm just asking the question, Was were they thought about? Um, and as we continue to move forward in this unprecedented time of college football and college sports in general, I'm not complaining at all. I, th I think I think what I've seen from our student athletes, from our football players, and how they greatly benefit from NIL. Man, I'm pro NIL as all get out. I want them to earn as much as possible. I just want to make sure that we try to keep um, every student athlete's experience the best that it possibly can be. I've talked on our show a lot about. Blake Baker, Kevin Peoples, and those yeah. those guys just went to LSU, and it was part of, for my money, one of the most underrated staffs in the country last year. Yeah, M Magazine culture is really good at emphasizing what you lose. Players and yeah. coaches, what did you lose? Maybe not so much focus on how did you backfill it. Yeah. What do you have? So walk me through backfilling those positions and how you feel about the staff you have now. Yeah. First off, absolutely have a ton of respect for Blake Baker and Kevin Peoples and the job that they did for us for the past two seasons uh, would not have had the success that we had without those guys. But any program's bigger than any one or two individuals, and you hope that um, that those guys have all the success in the world moving forward. But I'm also a firm believer that we were a part of their success too. Um, our culture, our environment had a direct impact and effect on the ability for them to shine in the light that they did. And so, um, you know, when those guys moved on, wish them the absolute best. But at that point, it's about us finding who is the right fit for us and, and who's going to fit what we do and who can actually improve us, right? Because at any point when you have adversity or people leave, it's an opportunity for you to improve the condition that you have. And so there were some things that, hey, we all have weaknesses, right? And so, hey, what are the weaknesses that those coaches had and how can I go find somebody that can, can improve them? Um, and I really felt like, you know, I was doing my due diligence on interviewing for defensive coordinators. I really felt like Corey Batoon uh, did an outstanding job from a technical aspect as a safeties coach. Had two All-Americans last year at South Alabama. If you look at the statistics of him as a defensive coordinator at South Alabama over the past three years, there may not have been a better, not only in group of five, but all of college football, the, the amount of success that they had. So if you look back at the success he had had at Ole Miss, the success that he'd had, uh, it made it a really good candidate for somebody to come in with something to prove, right? And again, when you look at the success that we've had from a coaching staff and from a player standpoint, all of us had something to prove, had a little chip on our shoulder that, hey, man, with, with this opportunity, I'm going to prove to the rest of the football world who we really are. And so when I got a chance to interview Corey and sat in front of him, heard his story, uh, you know, really dialed in the X's and O's, I thought, man, this is this is the right fit for us at the right time. Uh, it was a 
easy transition from a defensive schematic standpoint. They run some very similar defenses. Um, I think his uh, knowledge and te technical skills from the safety position have really translated. I think in spring I saw a huge jump in Joseph Charleston, Dalen Carnell, Marvin Burks, Trevez. I think all those guys improved significantly, not only in their man-to-man -man skills, but their footwork, their, their zone recognition. Um, so very excited about what he's adding to our team. Defensive ends, man, um, golly, if, if you would have told me we could have hired a guy who's had four straight uh, drafts, draft picks uh, from, from group of five all the way to the Big 12 now, uh, had a, a conference player of the year at, at, at the Sun Belt level, a um, ton of energy, ball of fire, very good evaluator, thorough recruiter. That's what we got in Brian Early, um, a guy who's really worked his way up um, and, and he's got some really good pieces in that room. You know, we added Darius Smith from Georgia. We added Zion Young from uh, Michigan State. We're bringing in Williams Nawari. We're bringing in Jalen Brown. Um, you got the Cotton Bowl MVP and Johnny Walker. You've got some other guys who are ready to just be developed. And he, he jumped in that room. Um, he, he is a ball of Red Bull every day, just full of energy going. And so very excited about what he's bringing and how that group now is really gelled around their opportunity in front of them. Two more things here. So the patch is right in front of me. The yeah. Cotton Bowl patch is right in front of me. Should have sat it on this side. The mascot, I don't know if people know this, but the mascot they gave you guys is like a full tire rubberized tiger that just sits down in the lobby and mm -hmm. you can smell him when you walk yeah. in. That's how you know it's a good mascot. Yeah. Um, what did that win do for the program? Um, wow. It, it's hard to quantify what exactly that win did for us. I, I think for me, it was it ignited hope for the future, right? It ignited the, the hope that we have of competing at the highest level in this conference um, and on the national stage. And, and that's why we took the job here. That's why we came to the University of, of Missouri to make it relevant on the national scene. And for us to, to, to play the way we did last year and then to top it off winning that game, to lose the players that we're going to lose to the draft, but then to, to be able to have this next group coming, Luther Burden, uh, Armand Mimbu, Brady Cook, uh, uh, Theo Weiss, right? Joseph Charleston, Tristan uh, Newsom, uh, to have these guys ready to, to, to take the baton and carry it forward for this season. I think for me it was just, all right, this is what we can and will be moving forward. Um, and this was the vision we had, and we're just halfway to it. And now we got to really put the foot down. we got to put all of our chips in the middle and really go for it. And, and that's the message that I have to our fan base. That's the message that I have to our team is um, we still have a lot to prove, but now it's time to double down on that commitment. When you guys came out of spring, which you already are yep. pretty early relative to the rest of the country, and you, you start self-scouting, self-assessing, both staff and roster, outside of depth, what are some of the things that you circled with Red Sharpie and said, that's what we got to hammer down on from now until we tee it up against, I think it's Murray State week one? Yeah. What are some of those things that we got to focus on here? Well, I mean, there's technical things. I, I felt like at the line of scrimmage, we were really good on both sides of the ball. Um, but we're always going to have to work on being more physical and creating pressure on the quarterback, right? So. From an offensive line standpoint, we want to create a more physical identity. Uh, you know, we, we pride ourselves on running the outside zone, and that's just requiring reps, reps, reps. We got to replace Cody Schrader, who led the SEC in rushing. So we're going to have to work the next four months on establishing that, that ground control. Obviously, with Brady Cook and Brett Norfleet, Luther Burden, Theo Weiss, Mookie Cooper, a couple of other guys, you know, we, we should be able to throw the ball with anybody. But in this league, you better win at the line of scrimmage running the football. From the defensive side of the ball, it's all going to be about creating pressure on the quarterback. Um, and we've got some guys there, but we're going to really have to refine our pass rush ability, winning one-on-ones, um, being detailed in our in our pass rush. And, and I think that's what they're going to work on the most. Eli Drinkwitz, we appreciate it, man. M-I-Z. Thank you for having us.